Welcome to Opalas TV. Today I'm in Singapore together with David Dredge. David is the CEO and CIO of Convex Strategies. David has 30 years experience in managing emerging market risks and trading emerging market derivatives. Convex has been in existence eight years ago providing risk solutions for investors through long volatility strategies. So David, three decades working on risk in Asia. Tell us some of the stations and some of the experiences you went through. I went to graduate school in, in Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, where I studied economics under Janet Yellen, and maybe more significantly now, options and financial mathematics under a guy named Mark Rubenstein of the Cox Rubenstein binomial model and the sort of founder of portfolio insurance. Interesting enough that was in 1987 at the peak of his business around portfolio insurance in the US equity markets. I joined Bank of America coming out of Berkeley because I wanted to stay in San Francisco which was closer to my home in Salt Lake City and didn't want to go all the way to New York and be so far away from home. Uh, to show how well I am at predicting the future, three months later they moved me to Singapore. So that didn't work out as planned at all. So coincidentally or conveniently in my history, I arrived here in Singapore the first Monday of October 1987 and uh, got here just in time to see the bank that I worked for and some of the senior risk takers there lose outsized losses in the crash of October 87 and it sort of dawned on me then that the organization I worked for that they worked for didn't really understand risk as it were and it was interesting to see that some of the questions that you may have had around Mr. Rubenstein's portfolio insurance business in terms of his understanding of the vol of vol and the liquidity risk he was taking and replicating options through dynamic future selling had significant implications on the performance of the markets on that very day. That and my time then with Bank of America in Asia where I helped them develop a lot of their local treasury businesses as Asian emerging markets started deregulating in the late 80s and this ongoing effort to understand risk eventually led me to sort of the, the pinnacle of my career, if you will, at the time where I pitched this idea around a positively convex core of risk embedded inside an emerging market business, allowing you to more effectively ride through the periods of market dislocation when historical volatility and correlation proved to be a very, very poor measure of potential risk in markets that were heavily managed and manipulated, think pegged currencies to, for the simplest example. And I managed to get buy-in for that idea and went to work for Bankers Trust and over time built what would become this, what we called a core risk business model as their emerging markets business. And that premise was very much along the lines of what we do today, this holding of a core of positively convex risk that produces not just returns, but liquidity in market dislocation events. So we're talking about your early 90s. How did you actually create convexity back then? in your portfolios. Great question. We had a great understanding or at least a developing understanding about the importance of convexity and risk management. But we're operating in all new markets that only just recently were starting to open up to the outside world whether that was currency markets or fixed income markets or equity markets and there were certainly no developed volatility markets at the time but one of the things that we came up to solve this problem is we realized in the financial repression in a sense that existed in Asia because their currency these now high growth high savings economies to some extent had their currencies pegged to the US dollar, you had negative real rates virtually everywhere in Asia, and the appetite for yield, we 
harvested, if you will, to get people to embed short volatility in what has become known as structured products to get that yield and then stripped out the volatility from those structured products. And interestingly, that today is still the underlying supply dynamic that leads to why we run our current business sitting here in Asia. And we sit in Asia because that supply demand dynamic that is the driver of value and volatility, just like it's the driver of value in anything, is still f massively driven by that supply through the structured product activity, which has become now not just one bank trying to strip it out for risk management purposes, it's become the overriding investment banking activity in Asia, as quite rightly, banks try to monetize the investor demand that is the global surplus side of the borrower demand that is the global deficit side. So if you think about banks back in my day of banking, in Asia, our client base is predominantly investor clients, and in the West, the clients are predominantly borrowing clients. And so we ran that business, and that business proved to be very, very successful on the premise, and we'll get into some specifics about how people use us, but on the premise that efficient convexity around your risk-taking allowed you to do more of the other businesses. It allowed you to take more risk because you were taking good risk, and so it allowed you to be very innovative and per innovate in your market making derivative structure and underwriting businesses because you had this insurance behind you that produced liquidity and returns in market dislocations. I did the same again with AB and AMRO. AB and AMRO eventually bought by RBS. I left the banking side and this is when I met you and I joined some friends of ours at Artratus and worked with them in helping develop their non-equity volatility component of their very successful volatility fund. We then launched this strategy originally within Fortress Investment Group back in 2012. And we've been running this strategy since then. So David, today uh, people still believe in the balanced 60-40 portfolio. So explain to us, where do you fit in? That's exactly the type of conversation that virtually every one of our meetings is about. Regularly, I get introduced to somebody and I'll go into that meeting as CIO of a pension fund and somebody's recommended that CIO meet me. And I come in and he understands or his perspective of what we do is, oh, you're a tail risk fund. And the first question he'll say or the first comment he'll make to me is, I don't know why so-and-so suggested I meet you because I'm not bearish. And I'll say, well, I'm surprised you say you're not bearish because you've got 50% of your capital in low-yielding, non-risk-mitigating fixed income. Because the point of me coming here today is to help you solve your compounding problem because you've been lacking participation in what has been one of the longest bull markets, equity markets in history because you lack confidence in the risk-mitigating dynamic of your defensive allocation very cognizant and rightfully aware that as interest rates approach zero, you're not going to get sufficient risk mitigation out of that to protect the equities you're holding. So pretty much every meeting we go to, Matthias, is, is about improving the explicit risk mitigation dynamics of people's defensive allocations, allowing them then to own more growth assets and correcting the convexity on both wings of their portfolio. And then this is where we get into talking, and you've heard me say this over and over again, it's just math. And so most of what we talk about with people is just the mathematics of compounding and the importance of performance in the wings relative to performance in the mean. Because of the mathematics of compounding, the big numbers matter a lot more than the small numbers. And of course, the big down number matters a lot more than the equivalent big up number. And so what we're trying to do, and we use these pictures and examples, this is an example of a 0.6 beta benchmark portfolio. And we've just drawn it with the linear line of historical outcomes. I think this goes back to 1972. 
S and P returns and where you would on 0.6 beta, which creates the linear line. And then we've created this hypothetical negatively convex or concave realized returns. Hypothetical, but uh, unfortunately far too common in the world of negatively convex liquidity foregoing asset managers. But the interesting thing is, while you can see that negative convexity, and it's not uncommon for how people behave, if you look at the next chart, you see the compounding effects of that. And the compounding effects are devastating. The big compounding line here, if you've just taken your $100 investment and put 60% in the S&P and 40% in zero yielding cash, that would have compounded to 800 over this time period. But you gave it to a institutional fiduciary manager who's done all the wrong things that create this negative convexity and it's only compounded to 277. I like to call this slide the where's my money slide. David, what causes this negative convexity and what type of behavior leads to that and how do you correct it? There's quite a number of things, but sort of things that stand out are very intuitive. Short-term return chasing. So one of the big problems is because people, fiduciaries, have managed to standardize for themselves a short-term return benchmark horizon, arithmetic annual returns, as opposed to long-term geometric compounded returns it leads them to do a long number of things that create this negative convexity. So you can think of fees, costs impair convexity, in particular costs that are linked to performance that correlates to market performance. So if you're giving, if you're paying a large performance link fee or performance link, think of a pension fund or sovereign wealth fund, if you're incentivizing in-house portfolio managers, and paying them bonuses linked to correlated returns. You're taking those returns away. In, in The fees are the biggest when the compounding matters the most. Also, things that perform well on a probability or volatility basis in the short term, but have bad long-term expected returns, like carry strategies. You can imagine that negative convexity starts to look very much just like short volatility. It looks like a short put option to some extent. And not surprisingly, as we are all familiar with, if you take the average of hedge fund returns over a very long period of time, it looks very much like a short put option. It's a famous Harvard study once showed. The way we try to work with people to help address that, number one, let's replace ineffective defensive allocations, fixed income being by far our biggest competitor, cash another really big competitor, but also diversifying strategies of a number of sorts. Let's replace them with something that's very explicit and very effective, allowing the portfolio to invest more in the growth assets that are creating the compounding during the upmarket. So you want things that participate in the upmarket, but you want to cut off the downmarket. I describe it as simple, and you, you may hate this because you're European and, and know it better than I do, but whenever I'm speaking in London, I like to use a simple football analogy, soccer to my American friends. Right? One of the challenges in the industry where you have a fiduciary, such an influence of fiduciaries managing other people's money, other people's capital, uh, in my analogy, the fiduciary is like the coach, and the end capital holders are like the fans. But the coach has managed to negotiate for himself a goal scored per game incentive structure when what the fans really care about is standings at the end of the season. So in the fiduciary world, that short-term incentive is around short-term annual returns. What the fans care about is terminal compounded capital value. Now because of the nature of the coach's incentive, he has this bias, if you will, to not employing a goalkeeper because the goalkeeper doesn't score any goals and he gets paid for a goal scored. Same time, he doesn't want to lose his job. And so you think about what most investment portfolios look like, they've only got very few goal scorers, growth, beta, 
and they've got a whole bunch of defensive midfielders, fixed income, diversifying strategies, etc., which they've hired to play defense, but they're incentivizing them to score goals. They're still evaluating them based upon their short-term returns. And it turns out historically, and you know this better than I do, they're pretty mediocre goal scorers. And because of the wrong incentive, they quite regularly tend to be on the wrong side of the pitch when it's time to play defense. A far better strategy, and interestingly enough, a far better strategy for both the fans and the coach is hire a good goalkeeper and put more goal scorers on the pitch. You'll win more games, you'll compound capital better, and you'll score more goals. Huh? And so what we go out and work with people on is how to start to bend this convexity in their portfolio by addressing the risk on the downside, allowing you to take more of the goal scoring, cost efficient, non-fee paying, market participating upside. And interesting enough, we show another picture where we've taken that negatively convex hypothetical return stream and we've flipped it over to positive. So you saw the previous compounding chart, that difference between 277 terminal and 800 to just get from negatively convex to linear. Well, imagine if we went from negatively convex to positively convex. Well, the math, it isn't just another 533% increase, it's a lot more. It's now 2,100 and something in terminal capital, simply by changing the convexity in your portfolio. Simply from changing the emphasis to performance in the wings versus performance in the mean. And where you're constantly targeting the performance in the mean, at the mean on a short-term time horizon, short vol, carry, lower volatility strategies look really good but those tend to perform very badly in the tails. And so we want to help people clean that up and start bending the convexity in their portfolios, winning more games and scoring more goals. David, you mentioned bending the convexity. That sounds really interesting, but can you give us a practical example how you actually do that? Uh, yeah, so here's a fun one that we use that we, we just drew up as an example. I'm sure you're familiar with the, the famous Warren Buffett bet back at the end of 2007 that no fund of fund strategy could outperform an S&P ETF index over a 10 year period. And only one guy took the bet, I can't remember who it was, a protege I think. And, and they called the bet after nine years because Warren was so far ahead. And if you read Warren's aftermath of it, or what he talks about, you know, he, reading between the lines, he sort of jokes about, don't bet against the US economy, don't bet against US companies. But he actually says a few things that tell the truth, that he's talking about exactly what we're talking about. He says, returns come and go, but fees are permanent, right? And so if you read about what Warren's saying, he basically knows that if he is competing with somebody who's chasing effectively the same correlated return and he's keeping 100% of the upside and they're charging fees on 20% of the upside and they're sharing the same downside because they're chasing the same returns, he's gonna win every time in a long-term compounding bet. The solution to beating Warren, which we worked out in one of our monthly letters, is simply own the same thing he owned with a little bit of protection on the downside. Because you'll, again, that convexity, just that tiny amount of convexity on the downside will change the compounded returns. Now, conveniently, in the case of this particular bet, it started in January 08. So the negative compound came early and came big. And as it turns out, for this example, we use the CBOE Eureka Hedge Long Volatility Hedge Fund Manager Index as a proxy of own the same ETF he owned and own some weighting in this index. So in his example, in his actual bet, you were allowed to choose five managers. So you take a sampling of the five managers that make up that index and invest in them and assume you get that index. It turns out you would have 
over the nine years that the bet was running, you would have beaten Mr. Buffett with a weighting in the long vol index of anywhere between 1% and 99% S&P and 90% in the long vol and 10% S&P. Any weighting in that range would have won the bet, amazingly. Now, in that, you rebalancing each year, etc. But it just goes to show just one negative compound event and cutting that off that convexity on the downside was enough to take over the compounding through that period to win that bet without doing anything to the top side. But imagine if you could have cut off sufficiently that downside event, and let's say since I'm on the hedge fund side of this bet, I can use leverage. I could have actually applied some leverage to own more of the protection and more of the top side. And now immediately we've started to bend the convexity on both sides and you make double what Mr. Buffett made over that period. Nothing to do with timing, nothing to do with views, nothing to do with stock picking, right? Simply correcting the convex in your book. I say this every day in meeting after meeting. If you want to change the compounding for your end capital clients, address the convexity in your portfolio. It'll have a far bigger impact than your weightings between consumers and industrials or your allocations to arbitrage or algo trading strategies, right? If you can fix the convexity, you will fundamentally change the compounding. If you change the compounding, you'll change everybody's lives because the size that you're managing, imagine in our example earlier, if at the end of this 30 year period, instead of managing a portfolio of that went from uh, 100 million to 277 million, you were managing a portfolio that went from 100 million to 2.1 billion. Right? It, it changes everything. And this you know, again goes back to the premise in my old banking days of really fundamentally changing the nature of a bank trading business by changing the convexity in that business, by not rewarding people for positively correlated carry risk and forcing performance recognition to revolve around positively convex risk. It's amazing over time how also the scale of the business becomes so, so much bigger because when you're taking the right risk, more risk is less risk. And the scale of the business can grow and grow and grow Proportionally, it's very hard for people to even understand or recognize because the world's so trapped in this arithmetic, single period, short term expected return probability as opposed to time averages of outcomes. Let me tell you a little bit more and go into some of the sort of theoretical elements around what we're talking about in the example we used there with Warren Buffett a game that people use to describe the mathematics around compounding is a game where you come with a hundred dollars and you bet your capital and if you win you win 50 percent of the bet and if you lose you lose 40 percent so in traditional financial mathematics you would say well that has an expected return of five it sounds good but if you're required in the game to continue playing with your new capital, you play again, and your new capital you play again. In a long time series, eventually an individual player will go bankrupt because the negative compound impact of the 40% loss is much greater than will be made up by the 50% return. So if you lose the coin toss, and you lose 40%, your 100 becomes 60, and if you win the next one, your 60 only becomes 90. And on that goes through time on a fair coin, such that the median, while there may be some people who got lucky and it went win, 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 and he becomes uber rich, everyone else has gone bankrupt, and so while the average is between zero and a guy who's really rich looks like 5% per game, 99 percentile of the participants are bankrupt and the median is definitely bankrupt. And so the solution to this game is 
in effect to reduce leverage or reduce the loss. And if you take this same game and negotiate with the guy and say, well, I'm a little worried about that. I want to, I'm willing to forego 20 of the percentage points of my wins to protect 20% of the downside of my losses. So instead of 50% win, I'll take 30% for a win in exchange for, instead of 40% for a loss, I'll take 20% for the win. And now playing that game has a certainty of compounding to wealth. And the median becomes very, very wealthy in that. And that's a mathematical example of really what we're trying to do. If you can reduce the loss, you can stay in the game much, much more efficiently through time, and the returns become much more relevant. Imagine, I was joking with you before, imagine if those returns have a 20% performance for you when you win. You have to make even more to make it a positive compound through time. It becomes astronomically difficult. The, the solution to this, and people generally aren't familiar with this, but the averaging through time is what's called time averaging versus the averaging across if a whole bunch of participants played, some would win, some would lose, and the average would be that 5% expected return. But that's called ensemble averaging or space averaging which is what we're all generally familiar with. The solution to this problem, in effect, of reducing the potential loss is reducing leverage. And in fact, that is what has made and, and why the system functions in a 60-40 benchmark portfolio. Instead of betting your whole 100% at those odds, you bet 60% and hold 40% back in liquidity so that your size of your bet declines as you're losing and increases as you go up and you've got a cushion so you don't go bankrupt. But even more efficient than that is an explicit insurance, long volatility and edging strategy that can even more efficiently cut off those losses, actually allowing to take more of the risk. If you think about the distribution through time, as I said, the median in that will become bankrupt. So anything um, you know, this side of the distribution over is bankrupt and there's only a very few people out here. Out here though, you would like to be adding to your bet. This is the Kelly criteria, uh, betting strategy, a risk taking strategy. If you can cut off this distribution by buying insurance that every time you lose twice in a low row it cuts off and force yourself to participate more on this side, you can actually add to your bets and take more risk as you go over here. Thus, again, bidding the convexity of both sides of your return distribution and creating you know, significantly improved compounded returns. So David, that's fascinating. Tell us who are your clients and how do you actually work with them? This comes back again to the, the whole balanced portfolio premise and the large allocations that exist in the world today around that philosophy and the recognition, as we touched on before, of the declining efficiency of that as yields get lower and lower and lower. And so our main investors are people who run large asset portfolios, insurance companies, endowments, family offices, pension funds, who are trying to address this challenge. And we work with them in basically, put most simply, replacing their uh, inefficient, low return defensive strategies with more explicit, more efficient hedging strategies paired with more risk. Uh, so our, our seed original investor replaced a portion of his fixed income portfolio if you think about it very simply, right? He, like anybody else, has some allocation waiting to his fixed income portfolio that was based on two positive attributes. One, running yield, and two, portfolio benefit, risk mitigating, and negatively correlated to the performance of equities and equity sell-offs. Well, when yields got low enough, it has less, if any, of those two benefits anymore. And yet, if anything, his allocation had grown. And so he came to us and we talked about a solution and we've helped him with that solution where he's replaced a chunk of that with a long vol strategy and more of the risk that he wants. Now, 
quite obviously through the, the eight years that this odd has been running, the performance of his additional risk in this environment has been spectacularly good. So even in an environment where, yes, bonds have performed very well over the last eight years, but they've been dwarfed by any sort of realistic weighting of long vol and long war equities and long war growth assets. Uh, another one of our investors has used us again to restructure unwinding uh, fixed income, traditional fixed income portfolio and extending into illiquid private equity direct investment strategies to try to capture more of convexity in the upside by protecting uh, the illiquidity of those strategies on the downside. And, and so, sort of universally, the people we're working with are replacing the low efficiency, risk mitigating dynamics of fixed income or other diversifying strategies with a, something that's explicit and more risk. If you think about how, you know, it's one of our challenges, one of the things that always I find challenging, the entire world has gotten very comfortable with the concept of foregoing the higher expected returns of equities to hold a chunk of their portfolio in fixed income because of the portfolio benefit of that. If you look at over the last eight years, uh, you know, you've foregone you know, something in the region of 11% return by holding fixed income versus holding equities. And yet there seems to be this real challenge to make the next leap. Well, wait a minute, wouldn't I forego even more and own something that might come at a cost, long volatility, that has far superior portfolio benefit, allowing me to own even more of the equities? So again, if you take the, the uh, CBOE long volatility manager index, in 08, yes, your fixed income went up, it went up about one-ninth what the long volatility managers index went up. And so you could own a lot less of this to get the portfolio benefit, allowing you to own a lot more of the thing that has the much higher expected return. And that's what we're trying to help people do and again change their compounding. We spend a lot of time working with them about understanding the convexity, understanding the ultimate risk in the diversified portfolio, which is really correlation, and how correlation leads to the outside of two standard deviation drawdowns that are the things that hurt, that, that what you really need is to protect against correlated events. Non-correlated events are the traditional buy the dip opportunity, the market always recovers. It's that correlated shock where everything's getting liquidated that you get the capital impairment. And that's what you really need the insurance for to allow you to have the confidence to participate in more of the upside. So how specifically do you actually create this convexity? Yeah, that gets into the hard part of the job, but uh, you know, there's very few of us in this business and that are willing to play goalkeeper, that are willing to go through the long, long cycle, hard, hard work of providing protection insurance. The solution for everybody or the challenge for everybody it comes back to efficiency, which we've, I've mentioned many times in the conversation. And, you know, cost to pay. You want your insurance to be the cheapest possible when you don't need it and have the biggest payout when you do need it. Now, the way we go about that is by looking for anomalies in the supply and demand dynamic of volatility markets. We consider ourselves value investors in volatility. We are not traders, we're not arbitrageurs, we're not timing events, we're not taking market views. We're simply evaluating supply and demand dynamics that are having impacts and creating anomalies in volatility surfaces anywhere they occur. I touched on earlier that we sit in Asia because the bulk of the supply demand imbalances that we see in the world tend to reside here because of the proliferation of these short volatility embedded structured product markets. But increasingly as financial repression has become more prevalent in Europe and other places, 
we see many, many more opportunities there that are attracting our interest. We think of ourselves simply as value investors in volatility. We track these supply and demand markets where, where we see imbalances created, and then we, within our book, try to build layers of convexity that allow us to capture both intermediate, idiosyncratic, non-correlated, more common events with low convex strategies, and the more attractive, if you will, low probability, high convex events that are the ultimate insurance in the correlated shock. And so through long, long periods of time, we're able to recover cost through capturing idiosyncratic shocks that come along, but as opposed to pocketing that and calling it returns, assuming it is a buy the dip market recovers, we're using that to invest in owning more and more and more of the highly convex payoffs through time. And so one of the real values of a good goalkeeper or portfolio insurance strategy or tail risk manager is a guy that's actually growing your protection through time. You can imagine the simplistic concept of hedging, buying a one-year put option. You start the year with this much potential protection from that, and by the end of the year, that became nothing. By probably a few months short of the end of the year, it's decaying to nothing. Well, you don't want your insurance to do that, right? You want somebody to maintain your insurance, and preferably, if possible, given that you're using that insurance to own assets that should be compounding positively, growing in value, you'd like that insurance to grow with it. Right? So I you know, jokingly say all the time, if I told you I could provide you insurance on your house, for a lower cost than your current insurance, and the payout of that insurance grew every year, well, you go and buy a bigger house, right? And that's exactly what we're trying to get people to do with their portfolios. Recognize that the value of this insurance allows them to go and take more of the risk that we're protecting and participate more in the up market. Again, bending the convexity on both sides of the distribution. Let me just carry on a little bit about the Asia supply and stuff. And people ask me a lot, you know, how, how do you find all this stuff? I have a lot of friends, as you know, that are in the volatility business, and they're always surprised at the diversity of things that we are able to get involved in. And I always say it's a simple answer to the question. I put a sign on my door that says I buy volatility. And all day, every day in these markets where the volatility supply demand dynamic, dynamic creates an imbalance, that supply comes knocking. And so we find stuff because it comes to us. And everybody in the, in the market knows I'm a value investor in volatility. I'm a distressed investor in volatility. I'm not the first call when you've got volatility to sell. I'm the last call. Because you, you know if you call me, I'm going to say, well, I'm interested, but I'm only interested if it's like this. And so almost by definition, by the time it's come to me, it's already a buildup of something that we either have been or need to be researching what's driving that supply. And that's the, where we spend all of our time day in and day out, is just following where the supply is coming from and the banks that are calling us saying, we're asked to sell this. So David, tell us about your team. How many of you are you doing this? We're a total team of eight right now. Of course, my co-founder, Julian Inks Chambers, who you know well, who is the CIO investor relations business side. And then here in Singapore, along with me, we have two more guys that run the portfolio that are both multi-decade experienced derivative traders, guys that I've worked with in the banking, my banking days. Uh, and uh, that monitor the vol markets and execute the trades for the book and manage the day-to-day -day aspects, which is somewhat challenging in a long volatility book. There's always something to be done. And then we have a, a, a mid-office fund accounting compliance team of three and an assistant. And, and we run all of it with that. The, the beauty of what we do, as with everything, is the inverse of an investment strategy. So we don't need to be a big team because we don't 
trade all the time. We don't give away liquidity risk, we store liquidity risk. Any trade that we do, we can just add to in size. We don't need more people to do different things. And we are only interested in investing in the things we want. So in a sense, we're a, uh, we're a price maker, not a price taker. People come to us and ask if we want to buy something. And we say, well, we want to buy it here. It's up to you if you want to trade with us there. Likewise, that leads to certain things that are different for us. Obviously, when we're buying the convexity and asymmetry from our investment banking counterparties, we're taking their credit risk, not the other way around that most hedge funds would be seeing dealing with banks where the bank are taking the hedge funds risk. So it's very important, again, that the banks adhere to our requirements as far as our counterparty credit setups. And so that's a very important part of the strategy and that we have two-way variation margin with everybody in daily mark-to-market P&L sweeps where we sweep P&L from them. And we have all the margin held and segregated margin accounts. We take no credit risk with our banking counterparties uh, other than the derivatives that we have that are daily valued and, and swept. And so the, the neat thing about what we do is when one of my friends who runs one of the big macro hedge funds or something in town, as they get bigger and bigger, they need to diversify the uses of capital. They keep having to hire more people and get more complex. And we don't have to. We can run whatever we run with the, the staffing that we have today. David, does timing actually matter when implementing your strategy? Yeah, again, that's a, that's a great question, a question we get asked a lot. And the answer flatly is no. The right time to correct the convexity in your portfolio was yesterday. The sooner you start participating in the next good up market, or, or not participating in the next big down market, the better. And, and so when timing is irrelevant in a sense. The, the sooner you start, the better. These compounding numbers that we're showing the further back you go, the more the compounding benefit expresses itself, whatever the period is. So the question that people get to along that is, okay, I get it, Dave. If I can improve my performance in the wings, I'll improve my compounding, and you can help me with that. But what if we go through an extended period of not hitting wings, that we go through an extended period of of flatlining markets, then I'm paying a cost for the insurance and I'm not getting the up market benefit, nor am I getting the insurance payoff because the markets aren't crashing. And while that's a realistic question and certainly a possibility, I, again, the uniqueness of my career lifespan, starting in 1987, have not really seen that. Now, I say that's unique because it was really about 1987 that then Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, innovated the now standardized central bank reaction function of cutting interest rates when asset prices fell. Prior to that time, that was not a central banking practice. And in fact, you had bond and stock prices generally going up and down together. Since Chairman Greenspan innovated that, and then every other central banker in the world has followed on from that with the supposed intent of smoothing cycles or smoothing markets. It's had the exact opposite effect. And we've gone through nothing but booms and busts, and booms and busts. And we're currently in an ongoing, almost unprecedented boom, certainly in the US on the back end of the tail end of a globally unprecedented extreme monetary policy experiment of globally coordinated zero interest rates, negative interest rates, quantitative easing, central banks buying fixed income assets, credit assets, equity assets, boom, 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 boom. So my view, and as I said in the book, we don't have a view. Our view in the book is this is a value investment in convexity. My personal view is I think it continues to be unlikely that we have an extended period of flatness. I think the more likely outcome, as we're seeing it 
right now today is booming markets, some might say melting up markets, and crashing markets. And central banks either continue to successfully inflate asset prices, and you want to participate in that by owning things that participate in it, not carry trades, you want to own beta, and then you probably want to have some insurance for the potential repercussions should they fail. Because historically, at the end of these types of cycles, the failures have been quite sharp in terms of correlated liquidity withdrawals in markets and crashes where the risk has developed the most. And where that risk has developed the most, what we call in my world uncapitalized tails, are exactly what we're out looking for, where the supply and demand imbalances have been created through the implicit application of leverage of store volatility. Think about last crisis, the biggest one being super senior tranches of subprime CDOs, where banks could tranche those and lever those just right and hold no capital against them. And so when the assumptions that went into that, the correlation assumptions of home prices changed, proved wrong, there was no capital to support those losses and it forced a bailout of the entire global banking system. Well, my guess is each cycle is different, but there will be pockets of uncapitalized risk that will result in efficient insurance payoffs to protect beta that's continuing to participate in the asset inflation boom. So David, you obviously have a very compelling and attractive solution for asset owners and fiduciaries, right? Pensions, etc. Um, but I wonder, do actually also asset managers come to you to enhance their risk return profile? Yes, uh, just about anybody who word of mouth hears about us that wants to explore the convexity and correlation challenges in their portfolio uh, gets in touch. Um, so we regularly speak to asset managers, financial advisors, other hedge funds who are challenged by this dynamic today where again using the 60-40 portfolio as a proxy because of the recognition that at such low levels of interest rates, the 40 in that example, is no longer sufficiently risk mitigating to protect the 60. And so the solution, as we touched on earlier, has been to run 50-50, reduce the equities and own more fixed income. And so you're in this dynamic now where you don't have enough equity exposure to meet your return targets on the top side, and yet the, the failed risk mitigating dynamic of your defensive strategy, even though you're relative to your benchmark defensively positioned, you're still probably running more risk than you're explaining to your end client base. And so you have this real challenge because of the convexity that that's forcing in your portfolio, where you're constantly impeding the performance and compound into the end client. And so yeah, we regularly speak to, and as you know, I have many friends that are in the hedge fund industry or asset management industry. And we regularly speak to guys about you know, how they're dealing with this challenge and, and how they can themselves, even in you know, a, a structure that very traditionally aligns to the short-term uh, performance incentive structure, but how can they step away from it and start thinking about geometric compounding and improving the convexity in their books. And you think about it, if you can solve that problem, if you can correct for the, the uh, flawed or inefficient or ineffective allocation to risk mitigating strategies and allow the freedom to participate more in the growth strategies, it's such an enormous change in the ultimate outcome through time of anybody's performance. And that's really where we focus our time and working with people. And, and you know, I appreciate you coming out here. And I'm glad that I've refamiliarized with what we're doing because you know, if you see people that you can see they're challenged by this, 
very hard to solve solution. They need to be thinking about the convexity in their portfolio and how it's impairing the performance, particularly through time, and what they can do about it. How can they change it? How do they change the construction of their portfolio? And how can you innovate and use long volatility as a solution to allow you to take more risk, to improve your convexity in the upside by protecting your convexity on the downside? And think about, you know, I could show you example after example how what I call a barbell strategy of long vol, long more equities outperforms the balance portfolio even during the period where the balance portfolio has performed its best ever. So during the period of you know, the last eight years where fixed income has had its greatest relative performance to long vol, you still would have been better off long vol, long more equities. Right? Now imagine at this point in time where now interest rates are at their all-time lows pretty much everywhere, is that what you want to own bonds as your risk mitigating strategy? Or do you want to own vol, which conveniently is also at its all-time lows, give or take, at this moment? And so the thing that provides the most efficient risk mitigation is the cheapest ever. The thing that provides the least efficient risk mitigation, fixed income, is the most expensive ever. What's the right solution going forward? If that was the right solution looking backwards, it's really the right solution today. 